pinky, or sorry, thumb, one of your seniors used to have this and had that removed. I won't reveal her name because that's her own private story, but if she wants to tell y'all, she'll tell y'all. But she had an extra pinky removed, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, there's an Indian actor who has that. Here's the Russian. Really? Yeah. His, his, his thumb is like... Like he kept it? He, he still has it. Still He's has known it. for it as well. Wow. Happens quite commonly. It's uh, like a birth defect. Happens a lot. Are they able to function with it if it's that yeah. bad? I don't Honestly, I don't know. I don't know if they can wiggle it around or use... I mean, like this one, obviously, they can. It's fully formed, but this might just be like a little vestigial digit hanging off that has, has no use. This is sure. different from that. Like yeah. Look at how this is connected to the thumb. Yeah. This is a full awesome. extra digit. Oh, but this is only four. Yeah. Oh. Why do you look hard? Because he's in this. Right here? Tell me. Oh, where's the child? Yes, your growth plates. And your carpal bones, as you can see, are not fully developed. That would be your capitate and your hamates. And you have your lunate floating right here and triquetrum right here. It's a little, I know. <laughs> Whenever, like, your baby that's about to be born, there won't be any carpal bones at all. There'll just be a big space right here. It'll just be squishy. Just be squishy. Yeah. So you gotta be very delicate. You know, we talked about proper, did we talk about proper baby yeah. holding on Friday? Yes. You know, don't let that head flop around. <laughs> please, please don't do that. I'm gonna chase you down and fuss at you. So, <laughs> is that because they aren't, like, that's a kid? Like they're uh, they're not fully ossified yet, or Correct. would they have to implant some? No, the carpal bones they develop over time. Okay, it's a very young child because the it's growth probably, plates are huge. This is probably a, uh, it's just a four or five, four or five year old there. So then the one on the left is also, huh? The one on the left is also pretty young. He's like what? 10? This is this is probably a t uh, it's probably a preteen because the carpal bones are fully developed. Is this but, the same thing as the one in the middle? Very similar, yes. So there's different kinds? Yeah, I mean, they, they develop differently. It's a birth defect. Just like, you know, I mean, they got some extreme deformities out there. Um, I mean, you got like hearts being born outside the chest, intestines born outside the stomach. I'm trying to, I don't want to freak our new mom here out too much, but you see a lot of really scary birth defects in babies. A lot of babies are so premature. Like I said, their hearts are actually born outside their body. You have to shut your ears, I apologize. I don't want to freak you out because you're about to have a baby. <laughs> but um, <laughs> the hearts are born outside the body, actually beating. Like I used to do x-rays all the time on kids like that. As they grow, they'll put the heart in the chest. They're so premature and the heart developed too fast, the heart can't fit in the chest. Same with the intestines. Sometimes they'll have the intestines born outside the body. So what they'll do is they'll put the baby in an incubator and hang the intestines above them in a bag. There'll be one little strand going into their belly. And as they develop, they'll start putting the intestines into the abdomen. I knew somebody that had a baby that was really impressive. Yeah. He was born with them outside, so he was in the NICU for a long time. Very challenging KUB, as you can imagine. Probably the one of the worst birth defects I saw was there was this little baby that was born with a tumor on its. What's? Well, let, let me go back. This baby didn't have a head. It was just a tumor. The whole head was a tumor. What? The face and the skull had not developed. It was a. It's probably one of the most horrifying things I ever saw in my time working there. Like the head was just a big sack, like a gelatinous sack. Like with a, it was just, yeah. And there was just a little hole with a breathing tube that they went down to the trachea, um, but nothing had formed. The head did not form. I think there was some brain tissue in there, but it was just like a vegetable. And they um, kept it alive for a while, but the baby passed. But um, that was that was one of the worst things, probably one of the worst birth defects I ever saw. Really kind of horrifying to see, but you see some weird stuff, some really weird stuff. Yeah. Some of these people come from other countries, they don't have the technology and they don't deliver here and things like that. They won't notice that stuff until it's too late, but um, some parents you know, they, they tell them like, do you want to terminate? And they don't terminate, but the baby's born. And um, of course there's extreme deformities and the baby can't survive. So it's really sad to watch, really sad to see sometimes. I think I just killed the mood for the whole class there. But <laughs> let's go back to upper extremities. We'll talk more about that when we get to pediatrics a year from now. Um, this is a very bad injury you can see on the right. Heavy lacerations. You'll see some of these come in, especially whenever they um, get caught in a lawnmower, things like that. Oh. Or fireworks. 
um, a lot of kids or adults really, yeah. adults being kids, are being stupid with fireworks and it blows up in their hands, like an explosive, this is the result. I believe this was a firework explosion, if I'm not mistaken. There's a football player lost through things like that. Can they actually fix it or like kind of lost cause? Yeah. Um, like they'll put it back together. This is salvageable. This is semi-salvageable. This is not. This is an explosion from a firework. I do know that one is. This one, I believe, is a lawnmower accident right here. Um, as you can see, not much left. Uh, kind of hard to reattach all that. I have a story on that as well. Um, this was a foot. I was involved with a surgery. A child got his foot stuck in a lawnmower, was riding on the lawnmower with the dad, leg dangled down too far, and foot got ground up in the lawnmower. So they brought this kid in, and the foot looked pretty similar to both of these combined. It was just a mass of flesh and bone. There just wasn't much there. So they recommended to the parents to amputate the foot, but the parents refused. They said, no, you're going to fix that foot. You're going to repair it. I don't care what you got to do. You're going to repair that child's foot. So I was in the surgery case. It went on for the entire day. It was like a multi-hour case. And I remember I ended up doing shift change, changing with somebody. I didn't get to finish the case. Anyway, all throughout that entire case, I kept watching them put pins in, repair the foot, and, well, this is a hand, but they were trying to repair the foot, put the pieces back together. They were putting pins and screws, and every time they would put it together, they would hold it up, and it would just fall apart. Oh, no. It would just fall apart. Like, fillet and fall apart looking like this. It's like, bleh, bleh, bleh. <laughs> So, um, long story short, they, I, I think the parents even filed a lawsuit against the doctor. Like, they never could save the foot, and they never had to amputate, but these parents were like, really going nuts about them having to repair that foot. It was a mess, like it was just unsalvageable. But, you know, they tried, they tried. Oh, really sad stories today. Yeah, uh, here's another, I don't know what this injury was, but this entire forearm is just ground up. Oh, I know what this was, this is a meat grinder. Oh, meat grinder right here. Obviously it ground up some meat. Mm -hmm. uh, is that why it's broken in like, like sections? Yeah, it ground it up, like it ground it up. Foreign bodies, very prevalent. Um, you know, a lot of your construction people, they always come in with nails in their hands. You'll see uh, that quite a bit. I saw one. You, you will see this quite a bit. And this is, I believe it's a bunch of sh shrapnel. I didn't see it in the hand, right I saw it in the foot. A nail in the foot. Yeah, yeah, I remember when I was, when I was a student, I was rotating at the county hospital in Lake Charles and a prisoner came in with a nail on his finger. I remember the doctor one asked me if I wanted to pull it out. I said, I don't think so. <laughs> that, that prisoner's like, you're going to stink guy. I'm not even going to, nope. <laughs> nope. Yeah, pull it out. No, I'm like, nope. I'm like, I'm a student. I'm not even supposed to, I'm not supposed to do that. You've seen a fish hook. You've seen a lot of fish hooks. Those things, man, you get a fish hook in your skin, yeah, you gotta go and get that. Go to the dog, don't try to pull it out yourself. You know how a fish hook is shaped, you're gonna tear a bunch of tissue out when you try to yeah. remove that yourself, so don't do it. Okay, review question four, hand and wrists. The articulation between the middle and distal phalanges on the second digit is named what? Middle and distal phalanges. There's multiple answers here. Look closely. The articulation between the middle and distal phalanges. The DIP joint of the second digit. Yes. Yes. Very good. Which carpal bone is in the proximal row between the scaphoid and the triquetrum? D. You seem unanimous on that. Are we correct? Yes, we are. The lunates. So, some examples of a couple questions. How we can ask questions of those. Now let's move on to the forearm, elbow, and the humerus. We do have more anatomy, guys. I'm so sorry. We have quite a bit more. Let's see what we can tread through here. All right. When we talk about the forearm, we have two main long bones that be in the radius and the ulna. We've already talked a bit about those. Anatomic position, guys, the ulna will be on your medial side, pinky side. Radius is on the lateral side or the side of the thumb. As you can see, a lot of anatomy we're going to be naming here on these two bones, guys. This is 
Um, as if we're in the anatomic position, by the way, that you're looking at on that picture, hand would be at the bottom, elbow at the top on that diagram. story for you all right so just to prepare you if you go to the hospital and you see a patient has gangrene make sure you have something to protect your nostrils gangrene is necrotic flesh that is rotting um, if you ever want to experience a smell that will stay with you the rest of your life and you'll never forget go get some gangrene sniff Although I don't recommend that. So there was this, this was my first job in Lake Charles. There was this patient that came in. She um, had a foot x-ray ordered and I walk into the portable room with my portal machine. So I go over to the bed and she's laying there with a towel over her foot. Like, ma'am, I'm here to do your, um, my name is John Donahue, here to do your x-ray, did my aided stuff, blah, 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 blah. I was like, okay, ma'am, I'm gonna go ahead and remove the towel so we can do your foot x-rays. <laughs> Now, this place was notorious for not really giving you any kind of warning what you were walking into. I kind of just went and did the x-rays as they were called. So, <laughs> I removed this towel, and like a punch in the face, if smell could take the form of a physical fist and punch it in the face, <laughs> this punching odor of rot hit my nose, and I almost like hurled like a Look, I, I start, like I started gagging, like, like, oh. So, um, no mask on, so she can see my face. So I, after I absorb the odor for a bit, I, I look, and she's missing all her toes, um, and there's bits of the bones sticking out, like little sharp shards, like where each toe was. So, um, as I'm trying not to throw up, and I'm smelling the smell, and trying to do the extra, I'm like, I kind of distract myself somehow. Ma'am, how'd this happen? <laughs> what happened now? Oh, well, you know, um, I found out my toes needed to be amputated, and I couldn't afford it, so I had my friend next door cut oh, them off for me. Oh. So, um, this guy had cut the toes <laughs> at an angle, so like I said, the bones were sticking out like little knives, like little spikes. And like the flesh was rotted, it was green, it was black, it was necrotic, it was dead tissue, it was rotten. Um, it was just—it's like it looks like just like taking a bite of her foot, essentially. It was—it um, was disgusting. So I got the X-ray done, and it was—it was horrific. But man, I will never forget that smell. If you ever see a patient with gangrene, like they do have stuff at the hospital you can put around your nose. It's like little, uh, like kind of Vicks to help you not smell it, but it doesn't really help that much. But. Uh, Oh, Stay away. What you said, you absorbed that food. I absorbed that food. Like you're still in the food, you know, you walked it in. Don't get used to it. No, no that's one of the worst smells you'll ever experience. Is gangrene. Gangrene. Gangrene, yes. It's rotten flesh. If you're wondering what a zombie smells like on one of the zombie shows, that's probably what they smell like. For how many weeks you did I think. Oh, how many did I not eat? Oh, I ate so fine later. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you get over it kind of quick. Smell Have blue cheese, probably. <laughs> Is it kind of this like... This might be too nasty, but I have seen some cases of like rotted, like... Uh, uh, let's save it for another day. I'm just saying the word maggots and I won't go further. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know uh, In fact, there was a, one of your seniors talked about the other day. They had someone that had gangrene on a body part. Am I gonna make you throw up? I'm sorry. Um, they had a patient that had some kind of gangrene on a limb, and it was a very disruptive patient who was pulling the maggots off and throwing them. Ew. Oh. Oh. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, dude. True story. No way, bro. True story. Hey, what I always say, guys, one thing about this career is every time you think you've seen and heard it all, there's always something new. Okay. It things fresh. Hey. 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 What? Yeah, there are so maggots and yeah. maggots are fly larvae. Yeah, fly babies. Fly babies. <laughs> so a fly had implanted babies in the rotten tissue. Oh, okay. It was growing new baby flies. 
It's worse than that because I used to work at Sam's Club, Warm. one of my first jobs, and um, I was, you know, I worked in the bakery and the meat market always threw their meat out, and I smelled rotten meat all the time. Much worse than that. Yes. Came back from vacation. Yes. All right, moving on here. Can we get back? Let's get back on track here. Um, let's talk about some of the anatomy of the ulna first of all. So at the very top here. We have two very prominent processes. We have what's called the olecranon process. It is proximal and posterior. And the coronoid process. This is what I'm referring to right here, guys. This is where your elbow, where your humerus connects to the radius and the ulna. The humerus fits into this notch right here. Let me see one of these models so I can show what I'm talking about. Humerus fits into this notch right here, guys. That's what we're looking at. That's that olecranon process on the back. It's the back of your elbow back here. Olecranon process. Now we also have the coronoid process. So this little notch curves down and forward. We have the olecranon process on the back. It curves down and comes up to what we call the coronoid process. That is on the ulna specifically near the elbow. Ulna specifically near the elbow. If we move over to the radius near the elbow, we have the radial head, the neck, and a little connection point called a tuberosity right here, a little protrusion, which we can see on your models right here. Here is your radius, head, neck, that little protrusion is the radial tuberosity. Once again, that's, on, that's near your elbow, near your elbow we're talking about up here. So olecranon process curves forward to the coronoid process. That's where your, your um, humerus is fitting into that notch to connect to your elbow. And then we have the radius with the head, neck, and the radial tuberosity right here. And we're going to look at that in different views. You'll be able to see it a little bit better. Now, one of your seniors had a little saying that she used to say that um, helped people remember. Because the electron process is on the back of your elbow. When you slam your elbow on the table and hurt it, you go, ow. So you say it's like the owl electron. Owl electron. <laughs> that works for you. Good. Yeah. Pretty good. I didn't come up with that one. That's pretty good. Now you'll notice that little notch right there, guys, where that electron process and coronary process is located. It actually curves down. If you look at your models, you can actually see it a little closer, a little easier to see on the ones on your desk. It curves, it makes like a little C-shape. That little area that's curving, like in that C-shape, is what's called the trochlear notch. The trochlear notch. So electron process, trochlear notch, coronary process. Starting so from the back and moving forward, making a C-shape. We'll be able to see that a little easier on the x-rays that we look at as well. Where is it again? Pointed on the screen? So, okay. electron, which one? This up here? Tro tro yeah. Electron process, curves, makes a notch. That's the trochlear notch. Yeah, so curves back up right. and forms that coronoid process. If you look at your bottles on the table, it's a little easier to see. It's on your ulna, near the elbow. Here, you want to see what I'm talking about? Yes. So, the radial head and Correct. Head, neck, and tuberosity on the proximal okay. aspect. Okay. You will not find that near the wrist. As you can see, the radius and the ulna are inverse to each other. Because if you move towards the wrist, look what you have down here on the ulna. Head, you can't really see the neck in that style of process. Yeah. Everyone seeing that so far? We on board? This gets a little more complicated here. Okay. We must have a snake. Now, like yeah, you know, when a steak like stands up and it's, it's like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. especially on the side view. I've never noticed that before. It's kind of. It, that's oh, right. You're right. Yeah. Now, <laughs> something you won't see on this diagram, guys, we have a joint up here that's similar to one we just talked about. Remember what this joint down here is called? Between the radius and the ulna? That distal radial ulnar joint? What do you think that one's called? Proximal radial ulnar joint. Now, fun little fact, when we do forearm x-rays, which you'll learn tomorrow, our natural inclination is to have a patient do this, right? Mm -hmm. Just stick your hand straight out, put your forearm like this, take your x-ray. We never do that. Does anybody know why? Based on anatomy. Take your models and... Um, I don't know if your models will actually make the action, but yeah, put your model in a um, position like this, in a PA. And I want you to look at the anatomy and tell me what you see. Too much air, too much space. Who said twisted? 
Does anybody see that? In a PA oh, position, what happens yeah. to the radius of the ulna? Oh, yeah. They superimpose on each other, right? Now, if you put it in a nice AP like this, it's a little hard to do with these models, I apologize, but if you put it in a nice AP, they separate. Pretty. Anatomic position AP gives you separated radius and ulna for a nice, ideal, optimal radiograph. So, we never have a patient put their form in PA. That's a test question, by the way, because the radius and the ulna cross each other. We must do AP. Isn't the human body fascinating? Mm -hmm. I always say that. <coughs> so, we're going to move up a little bit here, a little bit more proximal towards the elbow, because now we can see the humerus right here. And we have some more ideal anatomy that we got to name and label. So elbow joint proper, we have that proximal radial ulnar joint we just talked about. We also have the humero ulnar joint. Where do you think that's located based on the words? The funny bone. Connection, not the funny bone, we're gonna to get to that. That's the connection between the humerus and the ulna, humero ulnar joint. Then you have a humero radial joint. What would that be connecting? Humerus to the radius. You can see all three on your diagram. These three joints enclose in what we call a common capsule that's a synovial capsule that forms the basis of your elbow joint. Now we also have a lot more anatomy on this diagram that I want to go over with you. I want you to look very closely because these pieces of anatomy, people often forget, they get mixed up, and get kind of complicated. On the anterior aspect of your humerus, which we're looking at right here, guys, this is what I'm talking about, we have two surfaces. It's these two that I'm pointing to right here on the model. On the ulnar side, on the ulnar side, that surface on the interior aspect is what we call the trochlea. On the radial side right here is what we call the capitulum. Trochlea, capitulum. Trochlea, capitulum. Remember those two landmarks? That is always asked on the registry, on my exams, and people always mix those up. And I'll show you how to look for them on an x-ray as well when we look at that a little closer. Yes, yeah, so the anterior aspect of the elbow here, as if I'm holding my arm out just like this, anterior aspect, there are two surfaces on the elbow or the humerus right here. On the side of the ulna, where I'm putting my finger, is the trochlea. It sounds like trochlear notch, right? Because it shares the same side as that. On the other side, where the radius is located, is the capitulum. Capitulum. So the trochlea and the capitulum. If it helps, John's, by the way, where that funny bone is, the side of the funny bone is where the trochlea is. The opposite side is the capitulum. What is your funny bone, by the way? This is the funny bone right here. I'm sorry, right here, this is the inverse that we're looking at. Funny bone is this medial aspect that you feel on your elbow. It really doesn't feel good when you hit it. That's what we call the medial epicondyle. It's not on your diagram, but I encourage you to add that to your diagram. It's an important landmark. Medial epicondyle, we use it as a palpation point. This curvature right here that I'm pointing to, guys, is the medial epicondyle. So if that's the medial epicondyle, what's the one on the other side called? Lateral, Lateral epicondyle. Add that to your notes as well on your diagram. Yes. Yes. It's just not that humorous when you hit it. I already used that joke, but I didn't get any laughs on that one either. <laughs> The side of the capitulum is the lateral epicondyle, correct? So we can still see some of that anatomy we already named, guys. There's that coronoid process coming up front. There's that radial head with the neck right here. And then the radius and ulna themselves as a whole. Here's a nice lateral view of those bones, guys. You can turn your little models to match this. It helps. Here's our humerus. Here's our superimposed epicondyles, because remember, we have a medial epicondyle and lateral. In a lateral view, they superimpose, makes a circular shape on an x-ray. That's what we call our superimposed epicondyles right here. If you want to add that to your diagram in your book, your superimposed epicondyles. There is that electron process from the back again, the back of the ulna. Curves, moves up, and you want to add this to your diagram. This is where that coronoid process is located as well. Olecranon process, coronoid process, the area that dips is the trochlear notch. And let me say that again. Here's our olecranon process, posterior aspect of the ulna, curves down, 
forms the trochlear notch, goes back up to the coronoid process. Electron, trochlear notch, coronoid process. I would add those to your diagrams. That's not in your diagram in your book, but we gotta identify those on x-rays. There are, of course, some of the joints we already talked about, guys. Humeral radial, proximal radial ulnar. There's the ulna itself, followed by the radius, the radial head, and the radial neck that you can see right here. You okay? No, it's a lot. You okay? So we think the coronary process. The coronary process is right here. Like this with the joints. Yes. Coracoids in your shoulder. So, not to confuse you more, but you have a coronoid up here, yeah. coracoid here, coronoid down here. Just people making those anatomy names is got really, really mm -hmm. weird, yeah. Everyone's okay so far? Yeah. That's a lot coming at you. Still, so only chapter five. Yeah. Only chapter five. All right, so let's briefly look at the humerus, guys. Here's the humerus as a whole. Even though we are not going to talk much about the upper portion yet in this chapter, that'll come on the next chapter. We're going to look at the humerus as a whole anatomically because this will be a little bit of a preview for the next chapter. Here's what we just looked at, guys. There's those epicondyles we just talked about. There's that trochlea again, the capitulum. We have a couple of new ones here. We have that coronoid fossa. Where do you think the point of the coronoid fossa is? What fits in there? What did we just talk about? The coronoid, the coronoid, coronoid process. Coronoid the coronoid process fits into the coronoid fossa. Right next to it, the radial fossa. What do you think fits in there? What's connecting there? The radius. The head of the radius fits into the radial fossa. Usually the fossa is a little opening that another bone will fit into to connect. So, moving up to the top, guys, we're just going to briefly look over these. I don't need you to know these yet. This is next chapter, but it's just going to kind of give you a preview for next chapter since we're already talking about humerus. We're focused on distal, but at the proximal, we have a head. We have two necks, that being the anatomical and surgical. We have two turbical, tubercles. But like I said, don't worry about this area yet. We're going to come back to that next chapter. Focus on the distal portion right now. That's where I want you to look and memorize. Wouldn't hurt to go ahead and memorize that as well, because we are going to go over this, but that's next chapter. By the way, fun fact, does anybody know why we have an anatomic neck and surgical? Why would that be called the surgical neck? You might want to guess. You're, you're sort of on track. That's the most fractured area of the humerus, where the most surgeries occur, at the surgical neck. So humerus as a whole guy has a long bone in the upper arm, head articulates with the scapula to form that shoulder joint, and that distal end forms part of our elbow joint. Elbow joint is the union, I'll say that again, the elbow joint is the union of the humerus to the radius and the ulna. The union of the humerus to the radius and the ulna. Do we need to know the most common uh, fracture of the surgical neck? Or Not yet. Next next chapter. Transverse or whatever. Next chapter. And that's just a little bit of a closer look, guys. Like I said, I don't expect you to memorize this yet. We will revisit this next chapter, but that's some of those pieces of anatomy that we're going to hit on the next chapter. Um, I really like this one. I'm going to show my age a little bit here, but, um, you know, back to those 38-year-old Ninja Turtles that my people in the front row commented on. They used to say a word called tubular all the time. Like, that's tubular. That's rad, man. I always say it's an intertubular groove, man. You know, it's, like, it's tubular and it's groovy. It's an intertubular groove. I got some 80s and some 70s mixed there for you, tubular and groovy. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I was laughing at that joke myself. Okay. All right, a little bit closer look here, though, guys. Here's the main portion I want you to look at and memorize once again. There's that distal anatomy we just talked about. Medial epicondyle, that's that funny bone on the humerus. Lateral epicondyle, 
By the way, the medial epicondyle is on what side? Is it on the radial or ulnar side? Um, That's a great test question there. The medial epicondyle is on what side? The ulnar side. The ulnar side. Because the ulna is on the medial <laughs> aspect of the arm. Lateral epicondyle, trochlea and capitulum, once again, trochlea is on the ulnar side. Capitulum's on the radial side. That's where the radius would connect. That's where the ulna would connect. The coronoid fossa, once again, that's where the coronoid process fits into. The radial fossa is where the radius fits into. There's a little lycanon fossa as well. If you look at the back of your models, if you bend it like so, there's a hole going straight through it. That's that electronon fossa because the electronon process, as you move it, fits into that fossa. You move your little elbows on your tables, you can see what I'm talking about. The electronon fossa fits into that little hole. That's the electronon fossa. That's how you can flex your arm. You see what I'm talking about? That hole right there? You now, the electronon fossa we can usually see on our x rays, and I'll show you what that looks like as well. So, the electronon process fits into the electronon fossa. The posterior aspect of the humerus. By the way, when it comes to studying, guys, if any of you need to rent any of these out, we can have you take these home. Or we'll just have you sign out for them. So make sure you bring them back. These are available to you to help study. Yes, I can. You don't need to know that yet. It's just a preview. Like the back of it, the back of the humerus. So, say again? Yeah, so don't worry about the proximal aspect yet of the humerus. Focus on the distal near the elbow. So, for this chapter, we're focused on the elbow down to the tips of the fingers. It's our area of interest. <clears throat> Still okay? It's a lot. Yeah. I know. My brain hurts. Your brain hurts. So let's look at an actual x ray, guys, based on what we just talked about. What can we label on this x ray? We'll end on this slide today. I know your brain's going to break. This is an AP elbow. Let's look very closely. Let's start with letter A. That is a protrusion coming out the side of the humerus. What do you think A is? Based on what we just talked about. Medial, medial epicondyle. That is the medial epicondyle. On an x-ray, the medial epicondyle is always very prominent. Mm -hmm. It treats quite a bit. That's that funny bone. That's your medial epicondyle. So what would F be then? Lateral. Lateral epicondyle. All right. Letter B is talking about the surface of the humerus right here. What is that landmark that we just talked about on the surface of the humerus, on the anterior aspect? on the side of the medial epicondyle, there's your ulna. So what would that be? This is going to be the trochlea right here, guys. Let me go back a second. This is the, um, this flips, by the way. Trochlea on the ulnar side, trochlea right here. Ulna, radius. So if that's the trochlea, it would be what? The capitulum. Capitulum or capitulum. You can say it both ways, by the way. So letter C is referring to a joint. Do we see the joint right here? What joint do you think that is? Not radial owner. Look at what's connecting. What is this? Humeral. And then what is that? It's going to be your humero owner joint. Humero owner joint. What would letter D be? It's pointing to a part of the radius here. The head of the head of the radius. So what joint would this be? Humeroradial joint. Now letter H, what is letter H referring to? On the AP here, we see a kind of a darkened area right here. It looks like a circle. You see what I'm talking about? Yeah. Does everybody see that? Mm -hmm. What do you think that is based on what I just showed you on those models? Fossa. That's the olecranon fossa. Olecranon fossa, which we can see straight from the bone there. So. Let's review again, guys. I see some of your eyes rolling in the back of your head. There's a lot coming at you. A is going to be your medial epicondyle, medial aspect. B is the trochlea. C is going to be that humero ulnar joint. D is the head of your radius. E is the capitulum. F is the lateral epicondyle. What else can we name? 
head of the radius and neck. There's a little protrusion going forward here. That's going to be that radial tuberosity we talked about. We have a joint joining the radius and the ulna right here. Does anybody know what that was called? Proximal what? Radial. Proximal radial and ulnar joint. What about, what was that last one there, that hole there? What was that called? Olecranon uh, fossa. Olecranon fossa. So would that also fossa. mean the process is in there as well? The process is in there, yes. When your arm's extended, the process is fitting into that into that fossa. So is H more specifically the process or the fossa? H is the fossa because we cannot really see the process on an AP view. We can see it on this view here. But we're going to stop there today, guys. I see that you've had enough. Y'all need to start memorizing that anatomy too before we move on. So we'll end there today, guys. We'll continue on with the anatomy and we'll review those worksheets together on Wednesday as well. On Friday, we'll do our anatomical Play-Doh models together as a class as well as one of your first challenges for those bonus points. Guys, please start memorizing this anatomy. If you need to rent out any of these models, please let me know. They are available to you. This is a lot of anatomy coming at you and there's a lot more coming at you. You've got to stay on top of it and start memorizing or you will fall behind very quickly. All this anatomy that we talked about today, guys, we will see on x-rays. but We also use a lot of it for our centering purposes, for palpation, and for doing those optimal x-rays of each of the body parts. So please start looking over the material very closely, memorizing, use those worksheets, see what you can name, or review those in class on Wednesday. Question? Uh, when can you start to check those out or like start the process? As soon as today. Yeah. 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 Should be awesome. Whenever, uh, as soon as today, if you want to check out those bones, guys, just simply write your name and date on this sheet of paper and you can leave it right here on the table, right here. Make sure you bring those back, those are very expensive. Any other questions, guys, before we wrap it up? So for, we were talking about, like, right above, like, I have in this one, like, here. Uh-huh. So you were saying that that was the olive? That's the electronon fossa. So is that, but that's <laughs> behind, right? It is. But with the, the way the x-rays work, well, think about it. We're doing an AP elbow. What's closest to the IR? Oh. That aspect, so yeah. we're going to see it a little clearer. Okay. Yeah. All right, guys. Patient care is next. A little less intense. Big breather. We will get through this. I know it's a lot. Uh, rip those body parts out as you need. Just